So in spring of 2019, Stacy and I moved here. We were at the time living on the southwest coast of Florida, Fort Myers. We had been there for about 18 months, close to two years. And, uh, and there were a group of people who inquired about our interest in coming over here and, and starting a church. And so I wrestled with it a lot. I mean, Stacy wrestled with it too, but I wrestled with it even more, I think, because I didn't want to be a pastor again, to be honest with you. I had been a pastor for most of my adult life. Uh, I tanked that life in 2015. And I was a little bit skittish about entrusting my life into the hands of Christians again. Um, and so I was not super eager to become a pastor again, and yet, at the same time, uh, both of us felt this sort of unmistakable summons, this pull to do this. And so we began a conversation, uh, and that conversation has happened, and this is what has taken place. And in 2019, when we, when we got here, we, we moved here, really, and was, her and I talked about this at length, but... We, we moved here to create a place for people like us, people who were well acquainted with failure and loss and disappointment and sadness and guilt and this sense of not measuring up, people who were well acquainted with shame and regret and grief and struggle and consequences and death and sorrow and lostness. We came to create a place for people like us. We didn't come here to start a church for Christians. And we didn't come here to start a church for non-Christians. And we certainly didn't come here to start some sort of religious group. We came here to start a recovery place for humans. That's why we came. You know, the word uh, sanctuary literally means rest. And we named this place the sanctuary because we want to be we want to be a refuge. We want to be a place where it is safe to be real, where it's safe to tell the truth about yourself without fear of rejection. And what's interesting is that historically, churches were places where fugitives could seek protection from the law. Every person who fled to a church for sanctuary knew they were guilty. They fled to the church because they were keenly aware of their guiltiness. And that's why they went. Both, but the consequences of uh, breaking the law, as long as they were in the sanctuary, as long as they were in the church, the, the consequences of breaking the law could not touch them there. As long as they were there, they were safe. Um, we believe church is a place where guilty people gather week in and week out to be reminded that because of what Jesus has done from us, we are safe from the consequences of breaking God's law. That the long arm of the law cannot reach us here. That's why those doors are painted red. I've talked about this on a handful of different occasions. We intentionally painted those doors red so that each and every week when you walk through those doors, you are reminded that you're not walking through the door as someone who doesn't need the work that's been done on your behalf. Now, we come into this place and we are well-received by God. We are welcomed by God. We are loved by God, not because of what we do or don't do, but because of what someone else has done for us. How sad, ironically, that churches are now known not primarily as places where guilty people gather, but rather places where good people gather. That's one of the reasons why I kind of dropped out of church as a teenager, I just assumed, based on some of the things that I saw and some of the things that I heard, that churches were places where the good people go. If you're a good person, you go to church. If you're a bad person, you're recovering on Sunday morning from whatever you did on Saturday night, and you're definitely not going to church. So good people were church people, and bad people were not church people. I mean, that's sort of what I grew up thinking. And the more I talked to people, the more I realized that's what they kind of grew up thinking too. Well, I, at that point, realized I wasn't good. And so I just assumed that church and Christianity wasn't for me. It just wasn't for me. If church is a place for good people, I know I'm not good. Church is not a place for me. If, if Christianity is a religion for good people and I know I'm not good, um, then it must not be for me. It is a scandal to me uh, that churches tend to be the scariest places rather than the safest places for fallen people to fall down and broken people to break down. It's a scandal to me. 
Um, and the reason is because most churches think that God's primary goal for you is to make you good. That that's their mission. Their mission is to reform you, to make you good, to make you go from being a bad person to a good person. That's what a lot of uh, religious communities, including churches, tend to do. Um, and so you, because of that, you don't feel safe admitting when you and things in your life are not good. It's not a safe place for you to say, things are falling apart. My life is, my, my life is going off the tracks. Everything's coming down. Churches typically aren't safe places or people don't feel safe saying those things, telling the truth about themselves in that way. Um, because for whatever reason, the, on, unfortunately, the church's main goal, uh, a lot of religious groups' main goals, just make you a good person. So you don't, you don't feel the freedom to admit when you're bad or when things are going bad. But if you think God's primary goal for you is that you be an example of goodness rather than a trophy of grace, you'll never be honest about your sins and struggles, ever. If you believe that God's primary goal for you is that you become a good person rather than being a trophy of grace, you'll never be honest about your sins and struggles. In fact, you'll always feel the pressure to pretend that you're better than you are. You'll always feel fearful of telling the truth about the way things really are inside you, the way things really are in your life. If your marriage is failing or you're in the middle of an affair or one of your kids goes off the deep end, is church the first place or the last place you run to for help? You find out your husband is addicted to pornography or that your wife is an alcoholic or that your high school daughter is pregnant or that your business is failing and you have to declare bankruptcy. Is church the first place or last place where you can talk about those things? Well, for too many people that I've talked to over the years, it's, it's the last. What if you have a secret addiction or you're having a crisis of faith and believing that God is good is becoming harder and harder for you to believe. Are Christians the first people or last people you feel safe talking to about things like that? I have a friend who was diagnosed on Friday with throat cancer. And he has to start chemotherapy and radiation immediately, January 17th actually. Pray for my friend Todd. Uh, Mid-50s, a few years ago, he lost everything. Marriage, job, everything, everything. Uh, as a result, had to move in with his mom and dad uh, as a mid-50-year-old man. Uh, I mean, his life has been really, really, really hard the last two years. I met him before that. Uh, I met him when his life was good and mine wasn't so good. Uh, and he came alongside of me and was a friend to me when a lot of people didn't want to be my friend. And so now I have the privilege of being his friend uh, at a time like this. Um, and his adult daughter is like another daughter to us. And so I texted her to see how she was. Her and her dad are very close. And I texted her to see how she was. And this was our conversation, okay? Me, how are you? Her, not great. I'm just letting God have it, to be honest. Me, good. I've been letting him have it too. Sometimes he makes it so freaking hard to believe that he's good. Her, exactly. And all the Christians coming at you with Bible verses and telling you to have faith, and I just want to tell them all to F off because they have no clue. <laughs> Me, send them my way. I'm in a murderous mood. <laughs> Her, will do. Um, let me, in other words, I say that, I relay that conversation to you because um, Christians weren't safe people to fall apart in front of for her. To just say, I don't like God right now without some Christian saying back then, well, now you shouldn't say that. He is good all the time, you know? I mean, we talked about this when we looked at Job. We don't want to hear that in times of crisis when things are falling apart. Let me throw my temper tantrum. God allows it. Why won't you? God allows me to question and to spit and to cuss when things are falling apart and I don't know where to turn and I'm feeling desperate, down and out. When life begins to fall apart in every direction, God gives me the space. 
You can read the Bible from cover to cover and see that God gives people the space to fall apart, to break down, to argue with him, to just say, I don't like what you're doing. Um, And she didn't feel like her Christian friends were the kinds of people that she could do that in front of. Let Let me say something that I've said numerous times since we started. The only churches that will thrive in any meaningful way going forward will not be castles of purity where only the morally fit feel comfortable, but rather basements of grace where all are embraced and forgiven, places where sin does not shock and grace still amazes. Those are the only places that are going to make it in this world, in our culture. We want to be a pack a commune, a community of low anthropologists. Okay, now you're like, what? I, you've, this is a phrase that we've thrown around here uh, for a long time. Uh, it was coined by my friend Paul Zoll, um, who talked about low anthropology. And what he meant was uh, low anthropology means having a view of human nature that admits we all need help. That's essentially what it means. Um, It maintains, uh, having a low anthropology means that it maintains we're not the good, strong, independent people we like to think we are. Basically, it's an honest assessment rather than a dishonest assessment of the human condition. It looks at things the way they are, not things the way they ought to be. Um, It looks at humankind realistically, not idealistically, and what it sees is that none of us is sin-free, None of us. We are all imperfect people with a host of limitations and deficiencies, moral and otherwise. We are all, in fact, misfits. All of us. We want to be a church where worn out people find rest, where guilty people find grace, where failed people find forgiveness, where where misfits find mercy over and over and over again. We want to be a place of safety and refuge where people can come as they are, not as they should be, and find love and laughter and hope and healing and acceptance and help and those sorts of things. Our mission, which is on the wall, our mission statement, which is on the wall when you walk in the door, and we talk about it a lot around here, our mission is simply this. The sanctuary is a church where God's boundless love meets a broken world. That's what it is. And that statement assumes two things. It assumes that God's love is boundless, and it assumes that we are broken. It asserts that God's love is boundless, and it asserts that we are all broken. In fact, unless we see ourselves as broken people living in a broken world with other broken people, God's boundless love will never sweep us off of our feet. Grace will simply not amaze us. When you see yourself as the fallen, broken, needy person that you are, whether you like to believe that's true about yourself or not, when you begin to see yourself as someone who is in need, rather than that making life heavier, it actually makes life lighter. It makes you more free. Now you feel the freedom to tell the truth about yourself. When you know that God loves you unconditionally, And that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. That there's nothing you can do to ever tempt God to leave you or forsake you. When you know that you are safe and secure in God's faithful love to you, well, that that sort of sets you free from the need to be accepted and liked by everybody else. And when you feel the freedom to not have to be accepted and liked by everybody else because the only person's approval you need is God's and you already have it, well, that frees you to be a little bit more honest, more unedited, less photoshopped in the way that you talk about yourself and the way you present yourself. Um, One thing I say all the time is that the sanctuary is a recovery place masquerading as a church, okay? I love saying that because it's true. I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. I've told a handful of you, and I told Stacy this not long ago, I, it's, it's hard for me sometimes to, to think of myself as a pastor. And that's not because 
I don't love people. I, I, I am doing what I do primarily because God has given me a supernatural love for people, people in particular and people in general. And so I have been endowed with these pastoral instincts, these pastoral sensitivities. So in that sense, I am absolutely a pastor, probably more so now than I've ever been in my entire life. But on the other hand, um, that title uh, carries with it some things that just simply don't describe me. I think of myself more as just one of you. I've been given a gift by God to sort of lead and speak. You've been given a gift by God to do other things. And we're all sort of in this together. This is my role. You have a different role. But we're all sort of in this together, doing this together, stumbling through life together. Um, and I just happen to be entrusted with the responsibility of leading it. That's it. Um, so I, I don't know if that's... What a pastor is or isn't, that's what I am. Um, Because we we tend to think that um, those who are in recovery programs, for instance, are weak, you know? Uh, And those of us who aren't in recovery programs are strong. After all, we haven't succumbed to the destructive demon of addiction like they have. But that's a lie. It's a lie. The truth is we are all in recovery. We all have unhealthy relationships with something or someone that we depend on to soothe the pain, whatever that pain is, to make us feel strong, to make us feel secure, to make us feel safe, to make us feel important and in control. Your addiction, for instance, may not be alcohol, but it may be getting approval. It may not be sex, but it may be control. You're addicted to control. You need to be in control. When things are getting out of control, you feel like all is being lost. Your addiction may not be food or nicotine, but it may be financial security or fitness. It may not be getting high, but it may be the need to be right. My friend Nadia says that our drug of choice these days is knowing who we're better than. It's true. That's an addiction too. We're in recovery from that stuff. If you are a human being, you are in recovery. And what this means is that um, there are two types of people in this world. You've heard me say this before. Uh, People in recovery who admit they are and people in recovery who think they're not. But there's no one who is not in recovery. If you're a human being, you're in recovery. We all are. And so I've said on numerous occasions that while we have different recovery groups that meet here uh, during the week... Our largest recovery group, the sanctuary's largest recovery group, is in this room every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. It's you, it's me, it's all of us together. We may all be recovering from different things, but we're all in it. We're all in recovery. So it's not enough for local churches to have recovery ministries. The church must see itself as a recovery ministry, because if it doesn't, it's going to fail to connect the deep realities of God's amazing grace to the dark regions of human need. Um, Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. All of that was preamble. The sermon starts now, okay? (laughs) Cowboys don't play to 4.30, so we're in here all day, baby. I didn't preach last week. I got two sermons in me. That was number one. This is number two. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) two two obvious things pop in the first two verses of Luke chapter 15 the verses that I read the first thing to notice is the kinds of people who were attracted to Jesus verse 1 now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him that's significant That seems like a small, just a small descriptive verse that's leading into more important verses. That's maybe the most important verse in the whole chapter. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Who were these people? Who were the people who were attracted to Jesus, who were drawing near to Jesus? They were moral misfits. They were spiritual outsiders, people who didn't measure up religiously. 
Um, I've said for a long, long time that if we're not attracting the same people Jesus attracted, we're not saying the same things Jesus said. It's not. We have various ways to gauge the health of a church these days. Church leaders talk about financial stability, growth and attendance, the building of buildings, and so on and so forth, programmatic health, those sorts of things. But the real measure of church health is the presence of sinners who know that they are sinners. That's the real measure of church health. The, the presence of misfits who know that they are misfits. The second thing to notice after noticing that is the kinds of people who were appalled at Jesus. Verse 2. This is the second most important verse in this chapter, in my opinion. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. This was offensive to them. They were grumbling that the religious riffraff were flocking to this guy. Okay, the, the, I mean, they were furious. The religious fit-ins were furious. Uh, they, they were so annoyed at Jesus's derelict habit of loving sinners. They couldn't stand it. They didn't understand. This guy was breaking all the rules. They didn't get it. Um, these were religious people, spiritual insiders, people who thought they were good. That's who they were. Um, remember John chapter 8? It's the famous story of the woman caught in adultery. And uh, the Pharisees, religious leaders, caught her in the act. Okay, that's what it says. They caught her in the act, dragged her out to the city center, um, naked, ashamed, embarrassed. They dragged her out to where Jesus was. And their whole purpose in uh, humiliating this woman this way was to trick Jesus. They were pretty convinced that he was soft on the law and they wanted to prove it. And so they throw the Old Testament law in Jesus' face and say, uh, listen, the law says that we should stone a woman caught in adultery. What do you say? And Jesus, you know, doesn't say anything at first. He sort of kneels down. The Bible doesn't say what he writes, but he kneels down with his finger in the dirt and writes something. And uh, I don't know what he said. Nobody knows what he said. There's been a lot of speculation or what he wrote. There's been a lot of speculation. There are two places, however, in the Bible where God writes with his finger. One is the Ten Commandments uh, in Exodus, and the other is uh, when Daniel came to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, or was it King Darius? I can't remember, one of the two. Um, and he had had, the king had had a dream, and uh, there was a finger that wrote on the wall, and uh, the king couldn't understand what it was, and uh, he summoned Daniel to say, what does this mean? And Daniel said, this is God speaking to you and saying that you've been found, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. In other words, you're guilty. Both times God wrote with his finger, he wrote law. Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Maybe Jesus wrote to these guys. Um, maybe you haven't committed adultery externally, but if you've ever lusted after a woman in your heart, you're just as guilty as she is. Who knows what he said? The interesting thing is uh, that they slowly dropped their stones after he said, so whoever is without sin, who's not guilty of this, cast the first stone. And uh, they dropped their stones and all walked away. Um, here's, uh, we, we all, for the most part, know that part of the story. Here's something interesting that I picked up, I don't know, maybe two years ago that I'd never picked up before in the story. Notice, Jesus doesn't defend her in the sense that he doesn't say she isn't guilty of adultery. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you know what? You guys are falsely accusing this woman. She's not guilty, you're being mean, go back home. That's not what he says. The accusation against her is not false. It's true. This woman is guilty as charged. She's guilty. They caught her in the act. Now, we tend to look with sympathy on this woman and with disdain on these religious leaders, but what if this was your wife who was caught? having sex with your best friend? What if this was your mother or your husband's lover? 
or your son's wife. When you start thinking about it like that, you're like, okay, my feelings toward this woman, I mean, she's guilty. And God, Jesus doesn't say she's not. She's guilty. Um, Now, why do I bring that up? Because it highlights something supernaturally special about Jesus. It would be one thing if Jesus embraced the falsely accused, the innocent. That's not scandalous. In fact, we expect that. We expect Jesus to stand up for the falsely accused, for the innocent. What is scandalous is that Jesus embraced the guilty. That's what's scandalous. What scandalizes religious people like these guys in verse 2, what scandalizes religious people is not who God leaves out. It's who God lets in. That's what scandalizes them. Jesus, I was thinking about this yesterday. It's so funny. Jesus didn't go around preventing sinners from sinning. If he did, the religious people would have loved him for it. He's reforming society. He's reclaiming America for Jesus, okay? They would love him for that. Jesus did not prevent sinners from sinning. He went around forgiving them right and left, and it drove these guys nuts. You're being too free with your forgiveness. You're being too uh, amazing with your grace. You're being way too messy in your distribution of mercy, You realize that if you go around forgiving sinners left and right, this world's going to get worse, not better. Jesus, what are you doing? You're ruining everything we've spent our lives building. Gosh, that sounds a lot like religious people today. I hear it from them all the time. Every time I post something on social media about God's unflagging love for us, there's always some bloke in the back row that's like, no, hold on a second. You can't say that too flippantly because, you know, he requires holiness. I'm like, oh, just shut up, man. I mean, my gosh, like before these poor people can even take their first breath of fresh air, you're ripping off oxygen masks. Drives me nuts. Can you tell? Drives me nuts. Um, I mean, he he didn't go around stopping sinners from sinning. Even the woman caught in adultery, he said, where are your accusers, woman? And she said, they've all left. And Jesus said, well, there's no one here to accuse you, neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. He forgave her and said, now go and sin no more. Now, if we walk away from that verse thinking that this woman went away from that moment on and was sinless, we're reading it wrong and we're not reading the rest of the Bible. He's saying, don't do that anymore. It's making your life harder and it's getting you in trouble. So just stop, okay? Her sinning less or more had no bearing on whether or not he loved her. So Jesus didn't go around preventing sinners from sinning. He went around forgiving them right and left and that drives people who think that they're good nuts. Nuts. Drives them nuts. See, the problem with the religious people here was not that they said she was guilty. She was. It's that they thought they weren't. So the truest mark of a healthy church is the presence of sinners who know that they're sinners. The presence of misfits who know that they're misfits. To walk through those red doors, hungry, thirsty, needy, recognizing I need help from God. I need to be reacquainted with the forgiveness that I've, all, that I've always had with the grace that's always been mine. So I don't mind if people grumble and say that the sanctuary welcomes sinners and eats with them. I don't mind that at all. I like it, in fact, when they say the sanctuary is the misfit church with the misfit pastor. I like that. It's very punk rock, (laughs) and I dig it. Um, Because as we'll see next week, God himself is a misfit. God is a misfit God. He doesn't fit with the other gods. He does things very different than the other gods do. Um, Martin Luther, one of my favorite Martin Luther quotes, he said this. It's a prayer. 
May a merciful God preserve me from a church in which everyone is good. I want to be and remain in a church of the faint-hearted, the feeble, the ailing, the guilty. I want to be and remain in a church filled with people who feel and recognize their failures, who cry to God for comfort and help, who believe in the forgiveness of sins. He could not describe any better what I want to and what we all need. May a merciful God preserve me from a church in which everyone thinks they're good. I want to be and remain in a church of the faint-hearted, the feeble, and the ailing who feel, who feel and recognize their failures, who cry to God for comfort and help, who believe in the forgiveness of sins. Because when it's, when it's all said and done, okay, Christianity is for sinners. That's who it's for. It's for sex addicts and shopaholics and control freaks and adulterers and blame shifters and gossips and alcoholics and liars and narcissists and worry warts. It's for the selfish, for the angry, for the arrogant, for the unforgiving. It's for you. It's for me. It's who it's for. In fact, that's ultimately good news because sinners are the only people God gives his grace to. Heaven is and will be populated exclusively by forgiven sinners. Sinners who have been forgiven by a gracious God. And so I know that culturally, talking about sin and brokenness is not really in vogue, you know? I mean, we've been told since the time we were young, many of us, that we can accomplish anything we set our mind to. Self-esteem has been a really big deal. Um, and, uh, and so this idea that, we are, that we're broken, that we're sinners, it's, it's not very popular. Sadly, it's not very popular inside the church either. What's heartbreaking about that is that it's not until we come to the end of ourselves that we come to the beginning of God's grace and the freedom that it gives us. That's the joy and the beauty of recognizing that I'm a lot worse than I think I am, but God's grace is infinitely greater than anything I could ever ask for or imagine. It doesn't mean that we're always behaving badly. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about primarily the stuff that's constantly going on inside of us. The, I can't believe she did that. I can't believe he said that. Well, I, mean, what, 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 I deserve this. Even if you don't say it, Okay. The Lord, the pissy moods you get in, the ways you take your, your sort of anger out on the people around you, uh, your selfishness, your, all the, the little things that sort of, that just mark us. They mark us, which is why I love Jack Miller's old phrase. He's the old, he's a now deceased Presbyterian minister from the Northeast who said, cheer up, you're a lot worse than you think you are, okay? <laughs> but God's grace is infinitely greater than anything you could ever ask for or imagine. And like I said at the beginning, until we recognize that we and the world we live in is broken, God's boundless love will never impress us, will never wow us, will never sweep us off of our feet. It's magic in the best possible sense of the word. And we lose a sense of that magic. We become disenchanted by his grace because it doesn't seem needy or necessary for us or for the people around us.